Uh, we tried to get Julian Assange on the panel, but apparently he has a prior engagement. Um, you know, in uh, internet terms or internet slang, there are white hats and black hats. And uh, we're not sure whether Julian is either white or black, but I think the Ecuadorian embassy has a color for him. So we have a great panel tonight, a fantastic panel. I'm really proud to be here. And um, if this were a trade show, you'd be paying a lot more money to hear these gentlemen talk. But before I introduce them, I want to tell a short story. In the days following 9-11, there was a lot of anxiety and angst in this country. People were uncertain, they were fearful. We didn't know what was going to happen next. We had anthrax. We had people trying to board airplanes with exploding underwear, exploding shoes, and there was a lot of uncertainty. And the Pentagon, in October of 2001, did something very interesting. That is, they convened a group of people in Marina del Rey. And they were a two dozen Hollywood A-list screenwriters and directors who were asked to brainstorm with Pentagon advisors and officials over a three-day period to meet and develop terrorist scenarios. Oh, it sounds a little frightening. You know, Hollywood's pretty good at disasters, but uh, they're working with the Army and the Pentagon. And the Army has actually confirmed the existence of this meeting, but for obvious reasons, they have not released the content of the uh, remains of, of that meeting. I think there are probably enough bad ideas that come out of Hollywood anyway. So what does this have to do with cybersecurity? Truth of the matter is, black hats are ingenious, resourceful, and I hate to use the word, even creative. Inventing new ideas for ransomware, phishing attacks, and even the Internet of Things. The point is that we need to defend against the threats that we know, but also those threats that we don't know are those threats we can't even imagine. Cybersecurity needs to defend increasingly sophisticated, imaginative, and creative cyber threats, fifth, sixth, and generations beyond. Pixar doesn't have a monopoly on creativity. As Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And with this explosion of uh, cyber crime and the epidemic has escalated rapidly in recent years, companies and governments have struggled just hire enough qualified professionals to safeguard against a growing threat. The state of cybersecurity demand in California and our current supply of cybersecurity personnel dramatically out of balance. It's badly mismatched and it's getting worse. Currently, there are 36,000 job openings in California for cybersecurity professionals. Last year, California awarded approximately 1,500 cybersecurity degrees and certificates. You can extrapolate that nationally. Uh, one estimate is by 2020, there will be 1.8 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs. So if you're looking for a career, you might want to think about this. I'd like to introduce Scott Young, who is doing something very innovative to address this labor gap in cybersecurity. How many of you have heard of cybersecurity? <laughs> How many of you know what it is? Oh, come on, really? Do you? Do you know that before the smoke settled over Notre Dame, there were hundreds of fake 
charitable organizations that opened up to build the public of billions of dollars. Is that amazing? That's cybersecurity. What, what we are hosting, I'm with Synad, which is a nonprofit organization where ch our charter is to work with higher education to innovate in education. Basically, what we're trying to do is disrupt education to be more responsive to the world today. We have a, an initiative called the California Cyber Hub, which is designed to foster interest in young adults uh, to follow cyber careers by engaging them in cyber competition teams. Now, when I asked you what exactly is cybersecurity, the, t the competitions that we try to engage them in are competitions around infrastructure, which everybody knows, networking, you know, bits, bytes, all the tech geeky stuff, governance, policy procedure, risk, audit forensics, and social engineering, which is my favorite. Um, I'd love to see a game that students participate where they try and bilk each other out of dollars. <laughs> that would just be awesome. Anyway, what we've discovered through uh, bringing team-based competitions to junior high and high school students is that employers are starting to look at this activity as work experience. Why did they look at it as work experience? Because for several years, the competitors are working together as a team. They build collaboration skills, communication skills, creativity, and the most important is grit or persistence to try, fail, try, fail, and adaptability. Now, in my mind, adaptability in today's world is probably the most important skill you can have because they're saying that kids who are graduating from high school now are going to have five distinct careers over their work cycle. Five distinct careers. And they're not going to be just similar. They're going to be substantially different. So training our, our young people to be adaptable is probably one of the most important things we can do because we can't train them for the jobs that are going to be out there 10 years from now because we don't know what they are. So they need to be able to learn and they need to be able to adapt. A lot of the time these uh, teams learn discrete skills. They teach each other skills like uh, how to work with a Cisco router or work with Windows 2016 or Server 2006 or whatever. What we've tried to do in the competitions is to contextualize that discrete learning by utilizing cyber ranges and building critical infrastructures and building a game into that where the kids actually have to use this information in context. That's another great tool that employers are starting to look at to use internally to train their own workforce, their own workforces and build up their skills. Uh, because what a lot of them will say is that a lot of these people come in our doors with a stack of certifications, but they don't know how to work within our, within our ecosystem. We have to retrain them. What we're trying to do across the state is turn cybersecurity into AYSO. Is everybody familiar with that? How many parents coach? I need to talk to you after because we need cyber coaches, okay? Uh, we've, traditionally, we've based this on faculty, but faculty are busy. We're trying to scale this so we have 60,000 youth across the, the state participating in this. That means we need parents, we need business people, we need your tech organizations uh, being mentors. We need you to stand up and make a difference because everything that every one of you do and everything that you don't do, in other words, apathy, has a huge impact on what the future of this community and nation will look like. So I, I've got to stop or God's gonna throw a rock at me. So anyway, I, if you have any questions, I'll be around afterwards. Please come up and talk to me. I'll be happy to uh, give you my business card and we can continue a conversation. Love to have you involved in this. We'd love to have you working with these kids and I guarantee your first competition, you'll be hooked and you're done. You'll never, you'll never get out. I didn't.
So, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to introduce our panel for this evening. Uh, first up will be Michael Solstice. He's from uh, Cal State Channel Islands, and uh, he is a renowned professor, chair of the Computer Science Department. He does a lot of work for the military. I'm sure he'll talk about that. Adam Gray, who's a chief technology officer for Novacos, they provide uh, cybersecurity uh, services to Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the, his experience with the Sony hack. And Giovanni Vigna is a professor of computer science and co-founder of CTO at Last Line. He's at UCSB. And finally, Joseph Strong, who's on the front lines with uh, Community West Bank in defending the financial institutions that are there. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. I am Michael Soltes. As um, Guy introduced me, I'm a professor of computer science and the chair of the Department of Computer Science at CSU Channel Islands. Uh, very briefly about me, I did my PhD at the University of Toronto, and I did it uh, under uh, uh, Professor Stephen Cook. I'm thinking about him these days because he is turning 80 years old, and in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be traveling to Toronto uh, for a celebration of his uh, career as a scientist. And I'm mentioning that today because some of the ideas he came up with, uh, the uh, open problem of P versus NP, which is a fundamental problem in theoretical computer science, uh, percolates up in cybersecurity. Uh, what is interesting about Stephen Cook is that he has a, what is the Nobel Prize in computer science, he has a Turing Award. And his, uh, his career started in a very interesting way. His family, his mom and dad, had a farm in upstate New York, and the farm next door uh, was owned by Wilson Greatbatch. Now, how many of you know who Wilson Greatbatch is? He invented the first implantable pacemaker. He was an inventor tinkering in his barn with a homemade lab uh, and coming up with ideas that would result in a multinational pharmaceutical company. And Stephen Cook was a 10-year-old neighbor, precocious, uh, from a farming family, really interested in the work that Wilson Greatbatch was doing in his barn. And that relationship, that mentoring, uh, sparked in him a lifelong interest in sciences. And what I find so inspiring about this story is that Stephen Cook's roots weren't uh, directing him toward a career in the sciences. And by finding somebody who mentored him and showed him what to do, um, he ended up being the founder of the field of uh, theoretical computer science, and I was very lucky to be one of his students. After being at the University of Toronto, I was uh, at McMaster University, uh, where the main thrust of effort of the department was software engineering techniques for de developing software. And I'm mentioning that again because I will come back to that a little bit later when I talk about cybersecurity. And for the last five years, I've been lucky to be a professor at CSU Channel Islands. And I would like to point out that we have a contingent of students, if you guys could stand up for a second, uh, from uh, CSU Channel Islands. <laughs> And what is interesting is that they participated, many of these students are from the Cyber Cybersecurity Club, and a couple of weeks ago they participated in a Capture the Flag competition, national competition in the US, and out of 700 team, they came in round 50, right? So, very well done, guys. So let me start the presentation with a picture of another building. So this is a building in Dayton, on Dayton Road in Shanghai. And it is the, one of the many uh, buildings uh, of the People Liberation Army Unit 61398. And what the folks in that building uh, uh, 
do all day is uh, every floor of it is trying to hack into computer systems all over the world, especially uh, the United States. Uh, so, for example, they uh, stole the plans of the F-35, the most uh, expensive airplane in, the, in military history, and they essentially repeated uh, the design and they have their own J-31. And one of the goals of cybersecurity is to make sure that companies and whether public or private government entities that invest a lot of money in, de in developing intellectual property, they uh, profit from it. Now, what is interesting is that we have pictures of the gentlemen who were responsible for stealing those plans as well as hacking into the uh, DNC and uh, stealing uh, emails of celebrities and owning a lot of computers around the world. And it's interesting that we know how they look. Well, some of these pictures are posed, but some others were taken in a very interesting way. Kevin Mendia was an officer in the military intelligence in the US, and he founded the company Mendian. And when uh, the people in this building were breaking into Fortune 500 companies, he was able to trace the hacks back to this group in China, in Shanghai, city of 25 million people, and uh, break into their computers as they were doing their dirty work and take pictures of them as they were uh, doing that. So as they were typing in passwords and slowly get to know them by observing them and realizing that they behave as any other IT professional. They come in at 8.30, they email their girlfriends, um, they uh, you know, play online games for a little bit, but come 9 a.m. punctually on the dot, they start hacking into computers throughout the world. The director of the FBI at the time said that there are two kinds of big companies in the United States, those who have been hacked by the Chinese and those who don't know that they have been hacked by the Chinese. Now, uh, this is a, an example of a typical hack. I'm kind of giving a general uh, overview of cybersecurity with a few typical examples. This is what happens all the time. This was the Podesta hack during the 2016 campaign. Uh, he received this email, someone just used your password to try to sign into your Google account. Everything looks very legitimate, there is the Google logo, it has that simplicity of a Google email in it, and giving some details. So he forwarded it to his IT uh, department and they looked at it and they responded, looks legit, you better change your password. And uh, a few minutes later, Russian intelligence owned 60,000 emails uh, from Podesta's account. Now, the IT person who said change it um, later said that he simply misspelled, he wanted to say don't change it, um, <laughs> but that was too late. Wanna cry, that's another uh, typical example. Uh, we've, how many of you heard of Wanna Cry? It was rampant, so it was circulating all over the place. Another uh, state sponsored hack, this one was developed uh, by North Korea. It was using a vulnerability in the Windows operating system, and the National Security Agency has been warning Microsoft for months to update uh, the vulnerabilities. They finally did. But the problem is that they only update, they only release patches with updates for the last couple of versions of Windows. What happens to those who use Windows XP? And you may say, well, who still uses Windows XP? Well, for example, the entire British health service uses Windows XP. So very shortly, uh, it, uh, computers in the UK were frozen and uh, ambulances were diverted, hospitals were closing, scheduled surgeries were being cancelled. In a sense, then it is more than ransomware, it is terrorism because it's going after normal people. And 
In this case, what this did was uh, uh, encrypt your disk and ask you for money. And look how convenient. Here, Bitcoin accepted here. <laughs> so you just pay, except that they were so malicious that even if you paid, they wouldn't allow you, they wouldn't give you the password to unlock your data, so you would lose it forever. Now, how, how were we able to defend against this nasty ransomware? It turned out in the UK, in Cornwall, there was a college dropout whose name was Marcus Hutchins, who realized that this malware beacons back home in a sense to a DNS address, checking if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, it continues doing its work. And if it does, it would shut down. Presumably, the North Koreans who developed this malware wanted to have a shutdown mechanism. So they said, beacon home every few minutes and check if an IP address exists. If it does, shut down. Because they want to have a way to stop it. And so what Marcus did is he spent $10 and opened uh, that domain. And uh, a few minutes later, throughout the world, the ransomware attack stopped. So very simple, very magical. Now, Marcus Hutchins was in the United States last December, and we asked him to come and give a talk at CSU Channel Islands about his exploits. Unfortunately, when we asked him to come, at that time, he was being detained by police in Las Vegas for hacking. <laughs> uh, an example of something that happened a couple of days ago. Battle Creek, Michigan, the medical practice is being forced to shut its doors after cyber attackers wiped out its files when the firm refused to pay ransom. The rans the, they only wanted something like six and a half thousand dollars. Uh, but uh, the, the two doctors who were running this place decided not to pay, so all their files were wiped out, and they decided that the simplest thing would be to retire early. And it's a sad story because it happens so often. The percentages change all the time, but roughly half of small to medium-sized businesses in the United States experience ransomware, and of those who do, about a quarter go bankrupt as a result. There are ways to prevent it, and I'll, I'll mention it a little bit later. Emotet. Uh, Zane Gittens, who is sitting here, has a lot of experience uh, with this malware. It's very crafty. It encrypts itself. It compresses itself and encrypts itself, so its signature cannot be recognized by anti antivirus software. It get, gets into the cache of your browser, finds out who you're banking with, and then it logs into your account, it gets the money, but before it does it, it takes a nice screenshot of how your bank account looked before it took it. And next time you try to log in, it does a man in the middle, and instead of letting you log in, it shows you that image. So you're not even aware that your money is gone. Devilish and elegant. Um, another thing that just happened, uh, the software patches for Aces uh, routers were compromised, and when you were downloading uh, the new firmware into your router, you would download it with uh, malware attached to it, probably Chinese. And this now places you in a situation where you're not just downloading things from unknown places, you're downloading products from reputable companies, right? Three very nice books. If you want to read about these cases in a little bit uh, of depth, David Sanger does the reporting for the New York Times on cybersecurity. Bruce Schneier, all three books are very recent. Bruce Schneier, wonderful book about the Internet of Things. Everything is becoming part of the internet. Your fridge, your car is really a computer with wheels. Um, and uh, there is no security really provided uh, other than security by obscurity in most places. No standards. And Life After Google discusses how, it, how important it is for companies to build in security from the beginning. 
not as an afterthought, like the internet, which was designed to be versatile and powerful, but security was something put on it uh, later on. The RAND Corporation uh, says that cybercrime has a global cost of those huge numbers. Okay. Now, let me tell you very quickly, what are these exploits? What are people exploiting? Well, here's an, an example of a very simple exploit that you can explain in a couple of words. Imagine you log, you're trying to log into an account. Your password, the, the, the passwords for that account are supposed to be eight characters in length. But what happens if you type in something that's longer? Well, the system is going to treat the first eight characters as your password, and then here and other uh, places after that, you can inject whatever you want. So what? The system will just dismiss it. Well, it's not so easy. I'll tell you why. How many of you know who those two people are? Any guesses? So there is Stan Ulam and von Neumann, okay? John von Neumann. And they were the really inventors of the nuclear bomb, bomb at the Sandia labs during World War II. And to do the computations necessary to understand nuclear reactions, they had to design and build computers. And especially von Neumann, who was a genius, and everything he did had a touch of genius, came up with the von Neumann architecture, which is what you all have as your handheld device and as, a, as your laptop and as your computer. And one of the main features of uh, a von Neumann architecture is that both data and commands occupy the same space in memory. So, yes, you can inject here a password. You can, you can write the password, but what you write after here, unless there are measures in place enforced by the operating system by the server, you can inject whatever command you want, such as change the root password to something and something. I'm giving you a very simplified version. And the point I want to make is that if a system is very powerful and very versatile, it's also going to be very difficult to protect it. Think about it. A safe, if you have a safe, checking if it's open and closed is very easy. You just yank the handle. But how do you check if your computer well, your computer is infinitely more complex, so it is going to be a lot more difficult to check that it is secure, that it is locked. So why, why all these attacks? What are the reasons? Uh, how, how come we haven't fixed it yet? So let me explain that to you very briefly. How much time do I have left? Not much. Okay. <laughs> all right, so that looked like Half an hour? <laughs> First of all, large attack surface. We have to defend everywhere all the time. They just have to be lucky one time, one place. Complexity. That's what I just said about the safe. Attribution. It's very difficult to show that somebody is responsible for an attack. You may have a very good educated guess but will it hold up in court? Skills versus ability. If you are a pickpocket and you want to train your son to follow the family tradition and become a pickpocket, you have to spend some time teaching them how to do it. That's not the case with computers. You can buy a kit to hack off the shelf for a couple hundred dollars. Not only that, you can do it online and not only that, the companies that sell it have 24-7 hotlines. So if you're having trouble hacking, you can call somebody and ask them for help. So people, you know, script kiddies term comes from that. People who otherwise would never be able to develop those, those tools have them at their disposal with very little money. Small gains is how we think. We're all thinking, this is not going to happen to me. I have so many expenses in my company. Why should I invest? into something that will happen to others. Skills gap, what uh, Guy was mentioning before, as well as uh, Scott, 
there aren't enough people doing this, and public education. I'll finish here. I'll just say that the scientific foundations of cryptography, which is very often the conceptual framework with which we approach security, are developed, but insufficiently. For example, we cannot prove mathematically that any of the known public key crypto systems is really secure. So we need to develop the scientific foundations of the field. So far, they're inadequate. And the P versus NP problem of my PhD advisor rears its head here again. It's fascinating. Software engineering, how do we write software that is correct? That's a very good question. We don't know how to do that yet. Uh, business, IT, and acad academia partnerships, we try to remedy that. At CSU Channel Islands, we have a lot of relationships where we do research and development for the Navy, for the High Technology Task Force, for the industry in Ventura, and I hope in Santa Barbara, too. And education, public and workforce, as well as compliance, standards, policies, and regulations. These are some of the examples of the projects we work on at CI, but since I'm running out of time, I'm going to end with some good news. I, I don't really like this doom and gloom when it comes to cybersecurity, because it makes people feel powerless in dealing with the threats. In fact, they're not. Uh, I have a colleague in, in the FBI who specializes in business email com compromise, Kimo Hildreth, and I, we often give talks to schools and other associations of businessmen, and we teach seven basic practices that anybody can deploy about. The basic things about the backups and patches and good passwords, and the truth is that 99.9% .9 of threats can be avoided with a little bit of that discipline. Thank you. All right, you're all screwed. Let's start there. My background is spending most of my time doing one of a couple of things. Um, I'm 23 years in the industry. I run a small organization. This is all of the commercial I brought with me tonight, so we'll keep it very simple and very short. Sometimes I'm called to break stuff. Often it's to clean up other people's messes. So I'd say every couple of days we get a call into our organization of some poor organization that's been taken over, broken into, um, intellectual property has been stolen, and they have to clean it up. That's our life. It's not glamorous. You roll up your sleeves, you go to work, and it's pretty ugly. I'll tell you from the background, this is what I teach. So this, this comes out of, I took this slide because I, I wanted to spend a minute on it. Um, and really think about it, because this is what I teach to parents of elementary and junior high school students. Right? This is, I do an internet safety talk as sort of the, uh, the give back to the community around, uh, around town, around the country. And this is, this is one of those slides I took out of that. Take this in your personal life as well as what you do at work. If you write it down, it's public. I can find it. I can read it. I don't care if you think it's private. I don't care if you put it on the iPhone and you think it's safe. It's not safe, right? Let's start with that as our premise. Every time that commercial comes on right now with Apple, with the uh, your phone's safe, my daughter says, why do they lie to us? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, we, we got it right. We're doing okay there. So think about those things. All right, let's get into what the real issue is. The real issue is very straightforward. It's very simple. It's a people issue. You have a serious problem, right? You hear job shortages. I'm currently hiring for 2022 right now, because that's how long it takes to make a graduate computer science student useful to me. Minimum. That makes it so that like, I don't have to get up every day and go, boy, can they do the minimum job? It's a three-year investment to get somebody up to speed. So I'm not hiring for this year or next year. We're hoping for the year after. Um, we target our growth pretty carefully, so we know that we're not going to run out of people. I don't have an employee shortage. All of my competitors have an employee shortage. 
Now, there's good stuff happening. There's AI, there's ML. Um, Giovanni's going to talk about some really interesting stuff. We use some of his tooling today. I hope he covers some of that because they do fascinating research and amazing work. But it's still a people issue. We're all in a shortage. Now, you might stand up. You might be an IT professional here. You might be a security person. You're screwed also. A and here's why. You likely have a security guy or a couple of people in security. Now, when Sony got hit, we got pulled in on day three when they had no power in their data center, no routers, no switches, no computers. I processed their payroll off my laptop. It was bad. Their employees would not have gotten paid at the end of that two weeks if I didn't show up and physically take their payroll and send it out. That's an ugly situation. I'm happy to talk afterwards. We'll answer some questions. I'll cover what happened. But ultimately, if the IT person, they had eight security people. And those guys knew what they were doing. They are good security people. I'm not going to take anything away from them. They absolutely knew what they were doing. But they only had eight people. They had 10,000 employees at Sony Pictures with eight security people. Put it in perspective, my global customers that I work with, um, one of them famously said that we spend uh, $300,000 a year on antivirus and then another $480 million to secure the place the last 5%. Right? They're, the one of my group's budgets is, is a few hundred million dollars and 1,700 IT security people. And they'll tell you they're not getting it done. They don't have enough people to resolve the 65,000 employees they have. They still have gaps. They still have problems. They still have trouble. So if you think a couple of people are going to solve that problem in your organization to get you covered, it's not going to happen. Anybody with any expertise will completely take over the place. Nation states, it won't even be problematic. It won't even be an afternoon's worth of work. Um, in the 20 plus years that we've been doing security assessments, not a single organization has ever passed a security assessment by our group. We have broken in and taken over everything we've ever looked at. That includes water systems, sewer, electrical grids, banks, all of it. Um, on out, casinos are great. I mean, we have unbelievable casino stories in the background. Those I'm not going to get into too much, but that's the issue. And here's why. This is what you're up against. This is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. It's meant to be an eye chart. You have to cover off every one of these. And these are all individual methods of how an attacker can compromise you as an organization. It's painful. It's absolutely painful. And I'm not here to tell you that there's great solutions to this and that there's a silver bullet to fix it, because they're not. There really isn't. It takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of time, and, and it is a process-driven approach. I don't care what tools you own, I don't care how much you invested in technology, it does not matter. You have to have enough people, they have to be trained, they've got to be qualified. Now, the good news is, is we're in a job shortage, so if you're in this field, it's an easy place to be employed. Um, for those of you who are students in the room, we also do paid internships, so that is my commercial. <laughs> All right, so this is my cat. This is Skippy. The internet is not a friendly place. It really is not a friendly place, right? You could end up in a walrus costume. <laughs> it could happen. You may not want it to happen, but it absolutely could happen. It could get worse. I mean, there's like, you know, cat harness pictures with pink leashes. He's a boy cat. He doesn't need the pink leash in a cat harness, but, you know, neither here nor there. Well, what's the point? Well, let's say you want to talk IP addresses, and one gets flagged as bad one day. How do you know that it's good the next day? Do you have any way to tell? Right? We saw it bad. It's been quiet for six months. How do we know if it's finally good? You got a domain that pops up. It got flagged as uh, being malicious uh, a month ago. It's now suddenly not on the list. Do we trust it? Do we trust it for a month, a year? Do we not trust something because we looked at it last week? How do you know? Right? How do you know that the organizations you're looking at have not been taken over? Um, 
internally, we've been, getting, uh, we've been getting malware served to us through Facebook lately. That's been the attack for us, is targeted malware against my technical teams served through Facebook. That's a problem. We had to ban Facebook company-wide, turn it off. We currently block more than 1,000 sites from any machine going to. Most of social media is completely turned off for our organization because we started getting too much targeted stuff at us. Painful. So the internet is not friendly. It is not a happy place. It's not a great scenario to be living in. I'm not going to whitewash it and tell you how great it is. It's, it's awful. Right, so what are our threats? Well, every nation state, organized crime, all the simple ones, drive-by hacking, that's what we would look at as sort of the lower level ransomware stuff these days. I'm sure at least some of you have gotten um, ransomware uh, in, in through email, phishing attempts, other stuff. How many have had it come through physical mail? Have any of you guys had ransomware through physical mail? Especially if you're a man and live in a nice neighborhood and own a house? Did anyone get that letter? Oh, somebody must. They don't want to raise their hand. All right, here's what happened. Somebody took the whole tax records of, of all of the affluent zip codes in the U.S. and took a price of between $2,000 and $8,500 to $9,000 and sent them to every homeowner mail and said, we have photos of you doing bad things, um, and if you don't pay us, we're going to release the photos to your spouse. Anyone get that mailer? <laughs> uh, I got a couple now. Yeah, I hope you didn't pay it because, because that's really funny. All right, so how do I talk about security with others? Well, it's a people problem. It's straightforward. It takes a large number of people to resolve this stuff, and we're not there yet. To stand up to a nation state attack takes real expertise. Now, I talked briefly about Sony, that they had good people. The way they were finally attacked, or the way that their wiper was finally run against them, was using their own system tools internally. It was launched using SCCM. That's a problem. Right? If you lose control of the tools that you use to manage your environment, you're in trouble. Now, I don't think anybody in this room is big enough to use software like Tanium or others, but that's like sub 3, 4, 5, 10, 20 seconds to make a change across 100,000 nodes. Right? So you could really do damage with tools like that. I look at it more like a P2P worm than anything else. All right, how do I know where you're at? Well, if you tell me what regulations you're under, and you tell me what standards you've chosen or what standard you've chosen, and you tell me how your policy's there, and you tell me how you measure it, I can tell you how mature your security program is without ever seeing a single machine in your environment. If you tell me that your standard is a conglomeration of NIST and ISO, and we take from here and we take from there, I know that you're a disaster. I don't have to go any further. I know that you don't understand security policy and that you don't understand standards. Choose one, stick with it, right? And if you don't know which one to choose, start with NIST 800. The entire 800 series is supposed to be the bare minimum that you comply to, not the bar you hope to reach someday. If it's not, there's a lot to do, right? So this is how we talk about security. What are you regulated to do? What is the standard you've chosen? What policy frameworks and how have you put them together and how do you measure success? How do you know that the policy on what your password should look like or even if you should use passwords looks like? And the answer is you shouldn't use passwords. But that's a whole nother talk, right? And then this breaks out into, well, how do you lay it out in an environment? What should you be doing? So when I look at the next generation threats and I will go back to what happened and I think forward of, I have to have a plan in place that's supported by my regulatory stance, supported by my standard I've chosen, supported by my policy to cover off on every single one of these. Then I've got to select what technologies are going to help me, and then I have to operate them. Does that sound like a one or two person job? Probably not. I don't even think a thousand people is enough to get it all done. Right? My, my little org is uh, th like 330, I think, 340 employees, somewhere in there today. We struggle, just like the rest of the larger groups, to get this done. And I have lots of resources to work on this stuff. Right? I have to defend against ugly attacks on a regular basis. 
And the best we can hope for is detect it fast, have minimal impact, and squash it when it comes up quickly. Right? That's the best you could hope for in a current attack scenario. I get to introduce uh, Giovanni today. Now, I have a very brief one-minute story about Giovanni. <laughs> he doesn't even know this story exists, and then I'm going to get him up here. So Giovanni has a uh, black DEF CON badge. And the year he got that badge, I happened to be there competing in Capture the Flag. And I don't know that he knows this. My team got second place that year. And it was a bunch of loosely knit professional geeks that hang out every once in a while at DEF CON. Now, we were the team that had the bar set up at the Capture the Flag. So you could have drinks and hang out. And I was really disappointed that we got a second place. And the reason that we got a second place is that the year that happened, they changed some of the pieces, and they brought a lot more binary analysis in. And his group was brilliant at it. Brilliant at it. And so I've always said, I have a second, a third, and a fifth place there for DEF CON. I never got a first place. He has a black DEF CON badge. Anybody who knows what that is, there's no explanation necessary. Anybody who doesn't know what that is, it means that he's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Welcome, Giovanni. Let me, talk you, uh, let, let me talk to you a little bit about um, artificial intelligence security, mostly because this is something that is always touted as the final solution to the security problem, and I want to give you a little bit of a reality check. So you might consider this you know, brief talk a little niche, but it's something that you will hear over and over again from people that do security, that machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to solve every problem. So let me tell you why we do this. Uh, the old way to do things uh, is to use a lot of people. So, for example, uh, take antivirus, your McAfee, your Kaspersky. You have to write little signatures. So, uh, once upon a time, there were places, usually in the third world, where we'll have thousands and thousands of people that would look at all this malware and say, oh, I can find this sequence of bytes that really recognize this virus. And the virus were coming out so slow that it was possible to hire enough people. But now we cannot scale anymore that way, so we have to find a way to take these people, transform them into algorithm, and run them in data center. Okay? And this is for vendors. For enterprises, they have the same problem. Uh, the usual IT people that were working on a shoestring, trying to solve problems, are not enough. Now they have to deal, like Adam was describing, with an enormous amount of problems in terms of size and quantity. And so they want solutions that can handle them very fast at scale. So introduce artificial intelligence. So it takes all the humans out of the loop and transform them into machines. And I know that there is a lot of ethical issues about losing jobs. I'm not talking about that. I have my own opinion. Talk to me if you want later. But the basic idea is that there's been so much hype that this is the moment in which we have to sort of like, you recognize the Wizard of Oz, that's a terrible thing, but pull out the curtain and see who's behind the Wizard of Oz. Because artificial intelligence has been really touted as the solution to all problems. It's an all-powerful technology. And that's not true. And that's not true for security especially. Why? Well, let's talk about a little bit of terminology. I'm a professor, mostly. And so uh, I, I like definition. Artificial intelligence is a big field, and whose goal is to sort of reproduce intelligent behavior, whatever that means. Um, a subset of this is machine learning, and we will see what machine learning actually does. And that's what really made artificial intelligence so popular, is the subset of machine learning and actually uh, something called deep learning that is a specific way to do machine learning. This is not something that you have to memorize, uh, but you always also will uh, hear a lot in security about anomaly detection. I just want to make sure that everybody knows it has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. It's something that is orthogonal. So it, you can use artificial intelligence, you cannot use artificial intelligence, it doesn't really matter. But let's move on with machine learning. I'll give you the two minutes tutorial on what machine learning is. There are two types of machine learning. There is unsupervised machine learning and supervised machine learning. What is unsupervised machine learning? I have a bunch of data and I start asking things about the data, like is the data round, as more than three sides, or other things, so I characterize the data, and this allows me to take the data and put it together in groups. 
is called clustering. So it's unsupervised because I just characterize the data and suddenly see all this stuff is similar, all this stuff is similar, all this stuff is similar. Very basic, unsupervised. Supervised is different because I know something about the data before I start looking at it. So I say, for example, the red stuff here is really bad. The other color stuff is good. Now, what can I say about the grays? So I have some previous knowledge. So I supervise the algorithm by giving some initial information. The advantage is that once I know this, I put all the bad stuff there, all the good stuff here, and then what about this? Well, that is more similar to the bad. So I say, this is going to be bad. What about this other thing? Oh, this other thing is similar to the good stuff, so I consider it good. So you can see that in an automated way, I actually created a classifier. I can say, I can predict things about stuff I had never seen before. These two ways of doing machine learning are fundamentally all there is about machine learning. Now, you know what most entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley know about machine learning. Well, <laughs> why is this cool in security? Well, first of all, think about instead of going through an email and say, this is bad, this is good, this is bad, this is good. Suppose there is a system that say, here are 10,000 emails. They're all similar. Do you think they're good or bad? You look at one and say, I think they're pretty bad. And suddenly, you have erased 10,000 events from your system. Pretty useful, right? It would be like somebody comes to me and say, OK, all these students are very similar to each other. Are they good? I say, no, 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 that's you know, GPA too low. And I don't have to interview all of them, OK? Uh, by the other, using supervised machine learning, I can build classifiers. So I can build classifiers with people. I can get you know, features from you, decide who I consider nice, who I consider not nice, and suddenly somebody comes to me and say, oh, you're more similar to the nice people, so you must be nice. So I can automatically create classifiers, for example, for malware without humans in the loop. That is fantastic. I can scale up. I can do this for millions and millions of samples. What is the problem? The problem is that these techniques have been mostly developed for fields like image processing, uh, voice recognition, signal processing, where the data is not fighting back, which is exactly what happened in security. So since Adam used a cat as an example, let's talk about cat. Suppose that I'm learning how to recognize cats. I have a bunch of picture of cats. Now a new picture comes in, I learn how cat looks like. Great, say cat. Now suppose that a bad guy start putting in my data something that is different. Now I have something that is not really a cat, but my system will say, yeah, cat. They polluted the data from which I learned. Or even if they don't do that, and I still have good cats, suppose that they steal from me the models that I've learned. They steal from me the knowledge about what represents a cat. For example, you have ears and a tail, and then somebody shows like, like that, and you know, it's a cat for the system. A human will never make that mistake, but machine learning, no problem. So what is the problem here? The problem is adversarial machine learning. So when you have to actually apply all those techniques, supervised and unsupervised, to data that is actively resisting classification. I am a malware writer. I write a piece of malware. I'm not like, here I am. I am a bad guy. I'm going to take and encrypt it and hide it, you know, like it was described before, so I can pollute the data set you're learning from. I can steal your models from you and so find out what you learn and use it against you. How? By modifying my sample so I know that you can be misclassified, that you will misclassify my data and think it's benign when it's malicious or even it's, it's malicious when it's actually benign. So this is really a very difficult problem to solve. And this is a difficult problem because this is not the standard way in which machine learning was conceived. Going all mathy, uh, machine learning is an optimization problem. I got a bunch of inputs and outputs, and I have to do an approximation of what the next output would look like. Okay? And there was always a margin of error. And I can drive that margin of error in a way that is under my control. So I can drive your system, or your car, or your face recognition system to something different. And this is actually already here. 
there are plenty of papers in, you know, top security conferences that work on this. For example, this Accessorized to a Crime is a study where they looked at the top-of-the-line facial recognition system that uses deep learning. And this guy found out that if you actually have these glasses with these funky colors, you can take the system to recognize this man, a professor, obviously, for this actress, which is very different. Just because the color on the rim of the glasses could drive the recognition system to a place that was completely different. So, what have to do? What we have to do? In security, you have to have a very sort of adversarial approach to machine learning and make sure that you do artificial intelligence right. If you take the techniques that have been developed for image recognition, voice recognition, and you apply them verbatim to the world of security, they might work at the very beginning, and you could get this like, oh, I'm good, you know, I can detect this stuff. But then you will find out soon that you're very vulnerable to this type of attacks. And so you have to learn from the right data set. You have to, when you learn things, you have to learn to something that is representative of the reality that you're trying to model. If you're trying to understand adult behavior and your data set you're learning from, it's a bunch of kindergarten, you're gonna learn the right, you know, the wrong stuff. You have to filter data to avoid pollution. When you have machine learning in your company, are you learning from a source that is under your control? Also, you want to really see the real behavior of the things that you are analyzing. And this is particularly true in antivirus or malware analysis systems where they really cloak themselves and they pretend to be something that they're not. And so you really have to sort of extract their true nature before you apply machine learning. And also, you have to use various type of classification and clustering in order to do machine learning in depth. So you have to use different techniques to cover your blind corners. Now, for the super, so for the PhD students in the room, uh, of course there is a concept called transferability that makes this a moot point in most cases, at least theoretically, but in practice it works. And also, you want to have continuous quality control in your models. So, this is to say, AI can be used in computer security, but you have to be very careful, and it's not the solution to everything. But, uh, to, um, this is a picture, I was in Italy uh, in, um, last week, and I was at one major bank in Italy, and I was talking to one analyst talking about, I also am the CTO of a company that does malware analysis, we do a lot of artificial intelligence, and I went to his desk, and this was posting there, was posted on his desk, okay? Because there's every analyst in security so fed up of hearing that machine learning will solve all their problems that at this point we are at the reality check moment. Machine learning, artificial intelligence are useful tools if used right, but they will never be the solution to every security problem. Thank you very much. So while they're uh, talking about that, I'm Joseph Strunks from Community US Bank, and um, I'm very humbled to be up here with uh, these powerhouses. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here is because when they, uh, Guy and Bob asked me to, to, to talk as kind of a local where the rubber hits the road, um, I'm like, what the hell do they want me talking for? Um, I don't consider myself an expert on this, but I figured, hey, I'm gonna learn a lot, and, and I've learned a lot here. I'm gonna try to wrap these things together um, with what these guys have talked about on where it really hits financial services and where we see it hitting clients and, and, and the like. So, um, a couple of things. The requisite disclaimer, I am a banker. I'm the only one in a suit talking, so I do apologize like that. Um, it is what it is. Uh, so, I, I, I would also like to seriously point out, um, yeah, I'm not an expert. Um, I guess I know enough to be dangerous, maybe dangerous to myself. So um, uh, I'm just gonna have some fun while I talk, because uh, I, I just continue to learn and I continue to appreciate um, what I can get from experts like these guys. Uh, quick bio, I've been in banking for 28 years, executive level for the past six to seven, CIO, COO, I actually did a stint 
uh, for about three years as information security officer at another bank um, and uh, currently interim chief risk officer as well. So all the governance and risk and oversight framework and everything like that. Uh, historically, I come from the operation side, electronic banking. Um, for anybody that remembers Santa Barbara Bank and Trust, I was one of the guys that was crawling underneath the desks at the very first place, configuring their modem. So I was, that, I was one of these students here, these guys that I was crawling underneath there, getting all dirty so that, that we, we could foray into e-banking, uh, project management IT. Uh, been moving more into information security, business continuity, vendor management, you know, third-party risk. Uh, I'm Asaka Information Certified Information Security Manager, graduate of Pacific Coast Banking School. I've got an MBA in IT management and a BA in Slavic Languages and Literature and Political Science. So all the students here, you've made a good choice because if you made a bad choice, you would be a banker who... <laughs> Um, uh, Soviet studies, by the way. So you'd be a banker talking about cybersecurity 25 or so years from now. So excellent choice, all of you. So um, so you shows you how smart I am. So um, anyway, six key trends in financial services, at least as we see it in the financial services sector. It's these are hitting us or hitting our client base, our customers. And a lot of this is going to be duplicative um, and hopefully complementary to what um, uh, the esteemed gentlemen before me have already talked about. So mobile banking, extortion attacks, ATM debit fraud, uh, more on that in a second, third-party risk and exposure, threat actor behavior changes, and advances in threat management. So I'm just going to go over these real quick. I figure that during the Q&A section, you guys can ask more detail and for the requisite horror stories, because um, I'm sure these guys have quite a few. I got a, quite a few as well. Um, uh, uh, yeah. I. Let's just say that every day, don't, don't ask me what, my, what I worry about every day, because every day I worry about, I walk in the door and say, is all the money still there? <laughs> so that's all I'm really concerned about, is all the money still there? So mobile banking as an attack vector, that's getting more and more prevalent, obviously, because everybody's using mobile banking, Trojan infections in the mobile applications themselves, adware apps, we're seeing more of that. Um, when I say we, I say financial services. I don't want to articulate that my particular bank or any of my prior particular banks have experienced any of these things, although I have seen them occur um, in, in my direct environment or um, with colleagues of mine in the industry that we call and share information with each other. Uh, fraudulent banking services applications for credentials theft and malware delivery, that's getting more and more prevalent, especially on the Google Play Store. Um, it's a lot easier to um, put up, put up a, a fraudulent banking, uh, banking services app. Just needs to be up there for a little bit, a couple of people download it, all of a sudden they got your credentials, now they can get in and see your stuff and, and move it where they want to move it. SMS phishing and um, one-time password intercepts, all their... Um, things that we are seeing in the sector for mobile banking. Um, extortion attacks, new ransomware with ransomware continuing, you know, kind of like a, an extension on there. Uh, uh, again, this was mentioned earlier today, financial services extortion. This is, we're starting to see um, banks, uh, and, I, and I know companies that are getting emails saying, hey, you know, w w w we've breached you, and um, it's not the Bitcoin, it's not, it's not the ransomware that's there, but we've, we've breached you, and, so, and we've got information, we've got your client set, we've got whatever, so pay me not to disclose that fact. So there's financial risk, there's reputational risk, nobody wants their name in the paper. Um, and after I give this talk, I'm going to be worried that somebody here is saying, oh, I'm going to get him, and so I'm going to put him in the paper next week. So I just live a life of paranoia. Um, sextortion, um, using data from prior breaches to prove access to more sensitive information. Um, kind of those kind of go hand in hand. One has a more of a sexual nature to it. And then again, we just see at, at the bank, we just see the constant, the same old malware and compromise, the phishing and the spear phishing. Um, I, I, I will, you know, say that, you know, whether it was, you know, my current bank, my prior bank, the bank before that, the CFO, the CEO, the chief credit officer, myself, Every single day, three or four emails. Hey, we need to send this wire. I'm out of the office. I'm busy. And it's the same old thing. Now, we're working, you know, obviously the filters are starting to catch those more and more, but we have to be there. Um, uh, business email compromise was mentioned. Tons of stories about um, clients of ours that have been hit by this for 
um, six figures. I know of other banks that are going in the seven and eight figure losses because of business email compromise. And then of course crypto jacking gets delivered, all of a sudden your um, device becomes a node in um, a, a crypto mining um, in environment. So uh, seeing a lot of that um, in the space. And I had to put this in here as an example. This actually came to me uh, a Thursday afternoon. And the reason I put it in here is because I was working on this presentation deck on Wednesday night. And I just thought it was funny that the very next day I got one of these things. I hadn't gotten one of these things ever um, within the bank. And sure enough, I was naughty. Now all the files belong to us. And I'm thinking, you know, what's going on here? Are they even watching me? Probably because I'm writing this PowerPoint presentation and they, I've got it on the topic and they're just messing with me. So again, I live a life of paranoia. Um, but again, just a, a prime example, and, 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 and again here, of course, you know, we ignored it. We've stripped out some of the some of the bad stuff with some of the tools that we have. But you know, again, they're tools. They're not they're not foolproof everything. Um, ATM debit card fraud. I, I was debating putting this one in here because you know, fraud. It, it, it's not it, it's not cybersecurity. But in my world and the way I see things, every component of cybersecurity ends up with money out the door, which to me is fraud. So it's just the way that I have my frame of reference. Um, could be right, could be wrong, I don't care, that's how I think. Um, but uh, you know, card data is constantly com compromised in cybersecurity events, it's com constantly targeted. Uh, EMV chip doesn't solve the problem. All our cards still have mag stripes. Um, if all our cards didn't have mag stripes, I would feel a lot more comfortable but um, uh, merchant terminals and systems still have exposure points. Most specifically, a big irritation for me is gas station skimming. All those things, almost every single one of those still accept a mag stripe. They're so easy, the, the skimming is there. I, I, you know, every year, probably two, three times a year, at every bank I've been at for the past 15 years, we end up with a skimming ring coming through. You know, a couple hundred cards, a couple thousand cards get compromised. We can usually point it, you know, a couple ten thousand, hundred thousand dollars out the door. Um, and um, again, to be candid, maybe going a little bit off target, because uh, it really annoys me that we keep pushing back the requirement for those gas stations to upgrade their equipment, because it's just a hole, and it's just, it's just, it's an easy, easy, easy target. Uh, the other thing is now that they've got data from either other compromises or they've got it from skimming, they just go online to the card not present where they don't need the chip, so they've got the data that they need, card not present, and goes through, they're just using all your stuff, and the next thing you know, it's the end of the weekend, you're calling up money, you got no money, and it wasn't because of a bad night of drinking, you don't have anything because somebody's taken all your money. So, um, or they also, they'll take uh, the, the mules out there with a bunch of white label cards, they'll go to the Targets, they'll go to the Walmarts, they'll go to the... Um, the Best Buys, and uh, oh gosh, I can't get my card to read, can't get my card to read, can't get my card to read, I'm just gonna run it as a fallback. No, no, no chip. So uh, we see a lot of those. And, and they just, they're just little, um, you know, they're just little roving bands that go around and they hit up certain geographical areas, either physically with their mules or they'll, they'll you know, do it um, through, through the cyberspace. Um, and again, a lot of availability on um, card data on the dark web. A lot of banks are actually paying uh, and working with other companies to monitor the dark web to see um, what kind of stuff is out there. Um, so I, I've had some interesting experiences with that, and I'll leave it there. Uh, Third-party risk and exposure. Um, you know, this is for a, a relatively small community bank. You know, I've not worked at a Wells Fargo, a B of A. Um, I've not worked at places where they have gobs and gobs and gobs of, of security experts. Although, as, as Adam says, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter because you know they're already they're already compromised. But uh, you know, again, some of the things that we're aware of, I haven't seen infiltrating the supply chain through the small vendors, APIs and plug and plays. I, I don't know if you guys follow stuff in in Europe. A lot of this open banking uh, concept, and so more and more of wanting to be able to share information across applications, just increasing more, more, more exposure points. IoT, that was talked about, uh, talked about before. Um, I, you know, I, uh, my information security officer is, or officer is here, and I'm not gonna call him out, but I think he and I would both agree that there's not a single one of these things that we're gonna you know, let, let within the bank ourselves, and I, I don't even want any of them in my house, but I have two kids, so what can I do? Um, labor crisis, I think that's been talked about quite a number of times. 
Um, uh, try being a community bank uh, in a high, h- high-priced area. Banking is not sexy. Um, they can get a lot more money. Uh, you guys are going to get a lot more money. You're not going to want for a bank. You're going to want to work for a fintech. You're going to want to work for a cyber firm. The expertise and the difficulty in finding that expertise is why banks partner with a lot of companies like Nova Coast and, and similar and a lot of these other expert firms. Um, because uh, the expertise is it's just, just difficult to, ma- to maintain. And of course, also uh, the web skimming that we see. So a lot of banks will use third-party vendors to um, manage their websites if those get infiltrated or if um, there is some other type of exposure point. Um, uh, it, well, let me say it. Not so much the banks, but there's also it's both the banks and also there's merchants. So if a merchant website gets skimmed, you're going out conducting your transactions. We, I've seen this a number of times. They go out to, to, to get their transactions. That, that website has been compromised. You're in your cart. You put in the, um, your, your card information, your address, and your phone information, the security code on the back. You got your, your, your way. You still get your stuff, but they've collected your data, and they're just going to use it some other time later. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, just don't use the internet. So, piece of cake. Um, you guys got me scared anyway, so I'm just going to feel even worse tomorrow going into work. Um, threat actor behavior changes, uh, password spray, uh, targeting organizations with, with common passwords. So now that they know and they've ascertained that, you know, uh, an organization has a certain format within their emails, um, they'll take those and they'll just start, you know, sending things against, you know, they'll do it against websites, they'll do it against companies, they'll do it against whatever. Again, this is not ex- exclusive to financial services, it's just something that we see and we're aware of. Uh, coupling user ID from one breach with password from another, you know, pulling data together. Um, phishing as a service, uh, cyber attack as a service, you know, the, the script kiddies, and just outsourcing it. You go online and you can find somebody that was willing to do it, you pay them the right price. So, and uh, the black market vendors move in other social, social media centers. So, um, some of the advances, we talked about these, turning the dark web activity into threat intelligence, um, looking more and more into the dark web. I honestly, I don't know how effective that is because it's all buried in there. Um, that, again, I, I'm not my area of expertise. This is something that, that, that we're just getting into and exploring and seeing, is there a good way to find this information? Uh, this was touched upon briefly, uh, again, by Adam. Risk management is better than compliance. Um, you know, being from a bank, especially, it's like, we've got to be in compliance. 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 Well, that's the bare minimum. Um, we have to be better than compliance. We have to manage our risk. We have to think ahead, and we have to partner in advance. So we have some basic resources, regulatory guidance, cyber assessment tool, FSI, SAC for information sharing, NIST framework. It's the bare minimum, but it's a place to start the, with NIST and the, and the incident response and everything like that. Um, Giovanni talked about AI and automation tools. We're trying, you know, um, we at, 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 at the smaller banks, we're excited to see where that is. But again, it's, it's, not, it, it's a tool, it's not the solution, it's not the panacea, it's not going to solve everything. So it's this whole, you know, for my job, I see it as it's to be aware and to help my staff to learn, to help my clients learn, to be a resource to them, to bring in experts when I need experts, because a lot of this stuff is, I admit, way over my head, and I think it's important for everybody to understand when they're beyond their area of competence and expertise, and mine's like a really low threshold, so I bring in a lot of people. Um, And then training, training, training. I've always emphasized training, and I don't think anybody can emphasize training. I'm kind of shifting that over time, because you can only train so much, and to put the emphasis on the end user to ascertain uh, what was the example with Sony? You know, yeah, I sent off my stuff, and yeah, somebody looked at it. You know, they were aware of it. But there's, we have to continue developing those tools um, so that so that there's less and less reliance or less guilt on the end user to be the expert, their own expert in cyber training. So it's still important. We still emphasize it where I work. Uh, we still have a lot of training expectations, but it's I, I, for me it, it philosophically. I'm starting to think it's more about awareness because, again, you can't train everybody to know everything. Just be aware and just, one of the things I tell a lot of my staff members is just, if, you, if it doesn't look right, just don't do it, you know? Just 
you know, get that email, you get that, get the letter, and, and, and that's it. Just, just bring in an expert. Um, we'll bring in our experts. If that's internal, if that's external, we'll take care of it. So that's it for now. Um, horror stories later. <laughs> so. Um, my first question is for you, Adam. Uh, for the lay person, the average user, what action can we take to protect ourselves? Politically, economically, technically? You know, what are the best practices for the average person? So, I usually put my, my advice to what I would tell my, my parents um, as, as to how to protect yes, themselves. <laughs> and, and, and it's always the same even when I talk to others, which is there's probably two or three things from an economic pers perspective you should do. Um, your ATM card, the, the debit ATM card, should never come out of your wallet except inside your bank to get cash. Don't use it other places, please. Um, it's not that it's not insured, it's just a pain to get the money back. And your credit card that you use for every purchase, you can fight them at the end of the month if something's invalid. You don't have to pay them, the money's not already gone. That's step one. Step two, freeze your credit. Absolutely put all your credit under freeze, freeze your credit, and, and that's going to prevent a lot of damage, right? That's, that's probably the, the second most important thing to do. And, and then step three, try, try to limit your social media um, to a very small number of items and don't overshare and don't assume anything's private, please. Those would be the three things I'd suggest. Anything to add to that? I, I wanna add one thing because I'm a big believer in two-factor authentication. That's Whenever good. you can, use two-factor authentication, Gmail, Facebook, Yahoo, whatever you have, use two-factor authentication. That would save a lot of pain to you and you know, whoever is involved in your business. And maybe one more thing I would add to that as well is we spoke about ransomware attacks that are scary because your data is frozen. Now you have to pay a ransom to get it back, or do you? Well, if you have good backups, then you can just recover uh, to how the system was 10 minutes before it happened. Now, you have to be careful because if your backup just overrides old backups, then you may simply backup, you may simply recover to a point where the ransomware occurred. So you need good backups with versioning. I think having a stable, well thought out backing up system with versioning it's not expensive, you can do it in the cloud with, for example, AWS S3 services, and you're protected against ransomware attacks. Yeah, and corporate customers, when we see they don't have backups, paying the ransoms effective less than 50% of the time to get your data back. That's, that's been our experience out there. But we still have to recommend people to pay the ransom when they have no backup. So I've seen a lot of damage. My next question is, um, we had an election in 2016. We are aware. Are the <laughs> do any you of really you really want to go there? <laughs> Jesus. Do any of you this have an observation or comment about that? <laughs> go ahead, Giovanni. Uh, great. Um, we need to change our uh, voting system and switch to paper ballot. We should not have electronic voting. Please don't do that. Having paper ballots that are counted electronically but that can be manually verified is fundamental. Please resist any flirtation with electronic voting because it's really bad. Idea. bad. S Switzerland just learned this lesson. Yeah, exactly. They had I was a gonna say. Very, very weak uh, system that was very, extremely easy to hack. They and all it, are plants the, the seed of doubt in people's, people's heart. Because you can still do voting fraud, but the scale at which you can do it, if you have to fill in paper, is much smaller. With electronic voting, you flip a bit, and you know suddenly 1,024 votes for the geeks in the house have been moved. Yeah, one of your graduate students, Chad, uh, told me that uh, I think that a 12-year-old can hack into a voting machine. Yeah, that's been done. The, the, the groups that made the voting machines are 
uh, some of them are the same ones that made ATMs. And, and for those of you not in the financial, <laughs> yeah, for those of you not in the financial sector, um, ATMs are notoriously bad, notoriously bad and hard to secure. Most of them, some of them are still running OS2, which is an, uh, an operating system that has not been commercialized for two decades. Some of them, they're running a system called System 24, which is even older than that, which I doubt more than a couple people in this room have ever seen. Which paradoxically could be even more secure. Because which could be. All the yes. people that could <laughs> hack into that yes. are out of the picture. They're gone, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe you and I. Some maybe. are on AS400 still, which are fine. Um, but, but ultimately, there's large-scale attacks that happen on ATMs every year. Um, I, I know in the news recently, there was a worldwide attack that came out, and I worked on it in Latin America with our team, where people were infecting, um, they figured out how to get physical access to the outside of the ATM to infect it with malware, and they let the malware sit for months, and they came back and then dumped all the ATMs across the whole country in one night with thousands of people, and they lost hundreds of millions in just Mexico alone. Um, it was amazing, and not pesos, hundreds of millions of dollars. So it was a lot of money lost, and they did it all over the place, and it happened globally. There's been some reports now that have come out, but that was about two and a half years ago. Same group that made those ATMs are the group that makes the electronic voting machines. And I'm going to well, still wonder if the money's going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> so. Well, uh, my final question is, just in case we haven't given the audience enough to be scared about, uh, maybe you want to think about moving to the Yukon. Um, the, one of the big uh, new, well, it's not new, but big waves is uh, Internet of Things, IoT. And it rep for cybersecurity, it represents a significant threat. Um, I recently read about somebody who had their refrigerator hacked, uh, and it was uh, actually turned into a botnet sending out <laughs> spam. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so, does anybody have any observations about Internet of Things and uh, with the security threat it represents? Yes, I, I mentioned uh, in, in my talk a good book that I would recommend on that topic by Bruce Schneier. Uh, just came out last month, two months ago, on the security of the Internet of Things. The issue is that on, with the usual mm -hmm. devices, handheld devices and computers, the security standards and practices are lax. Well, in the Internet of Things, they're practically non-existent. The Internet of Things relies on security by obscurity. People who developed these devices thought, who would ever want to break into a refrigerator or a toaster? And to a certain extent, they're right. But that is very limited horizon thinking because somebody can deploy a toaster or a refrigerator in a denial of uh, service attack, in a distributed denial of service attack, for example. Um, and not to mention that, uh, well, now implantable devices, I spoke about Wilson Great, Great Batch and his first implantable device. Well, the new implantable devices are uh, very often communicate through Bluetooth with, with your handheld, for example. So it is conceivable, well, you don't, it's not a huge stretch of an imagination that you could attack somebody, their physical health, by hacking uh, their pacemaker, for example. Um, we recently also heard about uh, the Israeli uh, security service, Mossad, deploying a malware that was able to change the results on X-ray machines. So somebody would uh, be going to the doctor, and if they wanted to give them you know, psychological warfare, if they wanted to give them a good scare, they would uh, change the results so, so that it would show that they have cancer. So these devices, the IoT devices, devices that you don't expect to be connected to the Internet are all going to be connected to the Internet, and it would be very good to not repeat the mistakes of designing the Internet and building security from the very beginning. It's an important perspective to realize that you all have an IoT device in, in your pocket. It's got a microphone, it's got GPS, it's got a large data plan associated to it, and it's poorly secured. Every one of you carry one. Now, your house has probably got, I mean, a lot more connected now than you even realize. Um, significant risk. 
but there's lots of ways to keep yourself up at night. Um, there's also significant benefit, right? You can ask to set timers to IoT devices. You can listen to music. There's some really nice things as well. So put it in Don't perspective. Don't take away my Amazon Echo because my kids are gonna, <laughs> I, gonna make, you're gonna kill me. I, in I, the I, night. I have them in my house as well, and I like them, and I think they're useful services. And I simply realize that the thing I carry in my pocket has all the same functions to it. So there's there's some balance. Yeah, exactly. The, the balance we, we in security we call we, we talk about threat modeling. So what is the threat you're worried about? Because if you have to live your life thinking that the Chinese are trying to hack into your refrigerator, it's going to be a horrible life. It's like, <laughs> it's like having 50 locks at your door, and when you come home, tired, you're like, could you jump, could you jump, could you jump for 25 minutes? Who does it? And then your house is made of wood, and the guy with the saw zzz, opens a hole. So it's really important to understand who are you fighting for. I, I you know, I'm not in the, my, my you know, anti-burglary system is for, you know, to prevent, I think, kids to break into my house. But if somebody really wants to break into my house, it's so easy. You know, any determined burglar could do it. Don't do it. And kids, don't do it. I know that now you say, oh, authorized. Don't we will, do it. We will catch you. But it's really important to have that in mind so you don't go crazy. Well, let's uh, open it up to the floor for questions. Um, uh, we saw one Go over ahead. here. Go ahead, Matt. We have, a mic we have a microphone for you. Or screen. Okay, great. I have a, a basic business question, kind of basic, about credit card processing. We take a lot of credit cards, use a third-party processor. I'm not worried about that side of it. It's just initially getting that credit card number from our clients. Um, we used to, the old school way was they'd fax the form through, right? Which maybe is the most secure at this point, as opposed to emailing the document or uh, what, what, oh, we're using DocuSign now. Uh, the, the what? DocuSign. DocuSign. Oh, DocuSign. Yeah. So supposedly that encrypts it. What's, what's the best way? Getting back on the phone and just getting a verbal credit card I over think the phone? that's a question for you. Yeah, probably. exactly. <laughs> Yours, Joseph. Yeah. Um, fax. So your options right now are fax or phone. Email, DocuSign, phone. Um, God. I don't like any of those. Let, let's um, say not email. Uh, yeah. Not email. Yeah, email is straight out. I, I wouldn't even. I, I wouldn't even attempt that one. I, I. I. I'd have to do some digging, honestly, about DocuSign. I don't know enough about their encryption and their capabilities. I. I you know, I would assume that. If, if it's going through DocuSign, that stuff's going to be on their servers. Now you got to worry about what happens. Um, if they get compromised, now you've got PCI data because you're responsible for that data and you're out of PCI compliance as, a, as an acquirer of, 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 um, of transactions. Um, God, you know, fax, my, my first thought is fax. It's like, who faxes anymore? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, maybe between so, the three of them. I mean, phone, I mean, yeah. the problem is that with the phone, somebody could be in your system and intercepting the phone, you know. So I... I honestly, like in this moment, I don't have the best solution for you. So, I don't have but I don't think a phone would probably be, be helpful. There was an interesting case in Newberry Park in Thousand Oaks, uh, and apparently it, it repeats itself throughout the country. There was a fireman who was buying a new house. And the night uh, before closing the deal, he got an email from his escrow company saying, by the way, we've changed our routing information, so oh. please, uh, now, oh. anybody who bought a home, you know that there is a pile of papers this high that you have to fill out. Toward the end, you just want it to be over, right? So he, he didn't, oh. didn't think about it carefully and wired $280,000, essentially his family savings, um, to the new wiring number. If he picked up the phone and he called, he would have uh, gotten um, a warning not to do it. Now, what happens in this case? The escrow company is not responsible because they didn't send the email. The seller of the house doesn't live there anymore. They sold it as far as they're concerned. The lawyers are not responsible for the money. Insurance is not going to cover it. So this man lost $280,000. 
even though the FBI was um, involved in the investigation, they weren't able to recover it. I think this goes back to your multi-factor authentication. I think right. checking, is having a second channel of communication open just in case is important. But let's get a couple baseline questions. What's your average transaction uh, amount? Okay, so if you're talking large transactions over credit card, you're not talking retail, I'm selling something simple. So your transactions um, should be done via secure document send, and they should not put the credit card number into DocuSign, they should put it into your processor itself. So I'm not talking about the processing side. Yes. So use a third party for yes. That. You shouldn't acquire it. You should have them put it into the processor direct. You'd be better off that way because then if something does happen, your ENO steps in um, from an insurance perspective because you're talking about large enough dollar transactions for that and, and you're out of the loop of ever taking a card number in. That's how Lisa. I would deal with it. Let's take another question. Um, Doc, there's one right here. Good call. So talk to us about surveillance-based advertising and the role of that. Every one of us, when we go from one website to another, especially a commercial website, acquire a host of cookies from parties we never heard of. There's no audit, audit trail, there's nothing like that. How much exposure is there in that? What's the dark side of that? I, What's your threat model? You know, if, if you're tracked and you get you know, your information, the information about what you like and dislike gets sent to third parties. There are ways to scrap all that information. But sometimes it could be good for you. So I go to a certain website and say, oh, you really like camping. Here's something that you should see. And maybe that's useful. Uh, if you're concerned about privacy, there are lots of tools that you can use, including Tor, uh, to be completely anonymous. So. Once again, what's your threat model? I don't use any of those because I don't care. But somebody could care, and so they should use it. This comes from a legend in the technology publishing uh, world. Doc's been in the industry for longer than all of us. <laughs> don't think I didn't recognize you tonight. So it's good to see you. Um, the, the, and, and he knows some of these answers inside now because he's lived it. Um, on the adversarial model, there's, there's some problems today, right? There's, there's reselling of your data that you don't choose to resell. That's one of the reasons I'd say limit your social media interaction. Um, but you don't have control over that data, and, and you don't even have to be a Facebook user these days for Facebook to know who you are if you hit any service that they have off to, even without having an account there. So it's a problem. I, I don't think it's going to get resolved until um, until the regulatory piece gets uglier. Um, Europe's doing a lot in that space right now and, and trying to put a, a handle, you know, trying to put a, a you know, a, a strong uh, arm against some of the players doing it. But you've had a couple of groups this last month um, that, were, that were taking data and reselling it without knowledge and selling it through one service through another, and it's a mess. So I, I don't know that there's a security implication with the exception of your data is going to continue to leak out and you're going to be advertised to stuff or you're going to be sold stuff that you didn't necessarily sign up for. Question back here. My old neighbor. <laughs> so here is because, you know, the regulations and everything, you know, every data we have to send has to be like uh, encrypted, like share file or something. But you know, like uh, you guys know, probably the share file, then they got hacked. So how, what happened if our clients or some data got exposed, but who's responsible for that? Because we paying them, but what happened is somebody say, well, you guys were responsible for my data, and I sending, sending that to the CPA or to the banks. So who's responsible at the end? Depends on your legal agreement with your provider. So, if you're signing up for services and you're using a share system like your DocuSign contract or share file for the accountants, you better know what those EULAs state and you better have good, current, good amount of liability coverage on loss of your, your data. So we have a standard practice that we force unlimited liability on, on 
anybody that we sign a legal agreement with that would hold any of our data, and they have to meet certain standards. And believe it or not, like I, I've got Box as a is a, is a is a you know we're a customer for Box. We have an unlimited liability clause with them, right? Your liability clause with them might be a few thousand dollars for a loss. So negotiate well on those is my advice. So my question is, uh, is there any point in forwarding phishing emails to your bank abuse at Bank of America or whatever, and or reporting to the FBI cyber crime uh, website? So are you talking you're receiving a yeah, phishing if I, attack? If I get a, a, an email that purports to be from your bank, but I know... Oh, from the bank. Yeah, yeah. and I know it's not. Um, yeah. I would forward that email to abuse at your bank, uh, hoping that you guys would figure out who's doing it and stopping it or doing something that would protect me even more. And there are also times where I get emails that are, you know, extortion kind of things that I can report to the FBI's cybercrime website. Is there any point in doing either of those? Um, as far as if any of you were ever, you know, receiving an email that was purported to be from your financial institution, yes, definitely. Because, you know, there may be a one-off or there may be an indication that quite a number of the clients have been, and maybe an indication that, you know, the bank itself has to start looking at what might have happened. So, um, the more information we have, the more it's going to help us decide what, what action we're going to take for the same reason that you know, I can't say for every bank, but if we receive some type of, of, of uh, spoofing attempt or we receive some type of information or an email purported to be from a client with instructions, we will reach out to them, um, uh, you know, out of channel to advise them and, and you know, banks I've been at have been usually small enough where we know the client, they usually visit the branch still. Um, you know, we see each other in the community and things like that. It's not always perfect, but I, I can't, uh, how can I say it's a bad idea to share information when something like that happens? Um, when things like that happen at, uh, at the bank and we see enough of those occur, we will report, um, we will submit a suspicious, uh, suspicious activity report um, to get that information uh, out there. There's also, you know, there is, ways to report it to the, to the FBI if you're, and I'm just talking my, you know, anecdotal um, individual experience, you know, one call to the FBI to say, hey, I got this email, they're, they're, no, they're, I mean, we've had situations at banks that I've been at, and we were looking at 75, 80, $100,000 losses, which are relatively small, as you heard, and they don't even want to, it's not worth the time, it's just, it, it, there's too much out there with too many dollars, so. The, the financial institutions share intel on that. There's a group that they're a member of and that I'm a member of called FSISAC, yeah. which um, I'm allowed to share details on that kind of stuff with them and they share with the org and other stuff. And so when those emails go in, they do get processed. The most likely scenario is the banks try to do a takedown of the domain that it came from. That, that's what they try to do. It's not that your individual email gets processed, it's that there's a group of them, gets to a high enough threshold, and they go, okay, we need to go take that domain down. We need to go after it. And that's, that's the general behind the scenes what happens. So they're useful. Um, there's, there's whole teams of people at all the banks that, that that's, that's their horrible existence and job. So, um, <laughs> so I, I work at a larger, institution as well and we're hiring hundreds or thousands of new grads and there's a lot of academia here so we're interested in writing um, secure software of course but I'm shocked at how few graduates come out of uh, their, their degrees and, and learn about memory safe languages and newer things like Rust and Go and segmentation and, and these sort of things and they, they come in and they're writing old school C or Java and I, I'm wondering, can academia do a better job of teaching our young kids coming through the education system about these newer languages and technologies? Because as a very large bank, we want to hire people that know that stuff, not have to train them again after they come out of college. I, if I may say something about Absolutely. this. Absolutely. So I think what's, 
What's important is to realize that there is no way that we can produce graduates that meet the technical requirements of every industry out there. So our emphasis is not so much on making sure that they're familiar with every technology, futile task. What we want them to be able to is be good problem solvers and be good learners. The languages that you mentioned, if somebody has a degree in computer science, for them learning a new language, it's not a proposition of five years. They do it in two weeks. So what happens is that if our graduates are well-trained, and I think that they are, they have the problem-solving skills, they have the ability to absorb a lot of information quickly, they join your company and you train them to be employees effective in your environment. So I think it's a shared responsibility. Yeah, if I can add something, I think that uh, the important thing to teach is exactly what you describe as a feature of the language. So they should learn what a memory safe language is, what is, you know, how the stack is used, so that then when they are in and front... They and yeah, they and do. they do. And, and so do. when they're in front of a problem, they can choose the best language to solve the problem in a way that is secure. Because if you have to, you know, write a, a driver for, for, a, for an operating system in Go, good luck. You know, you have to use C, but then you have memory corruption problems. So I don't think that learning a language is a skill. I think understanding what each language can give to you in terms of advantages and disadvantages is the important skill that then you use to select the right tool for the job. We've got uh, time for one more question, and uh, let's, let's take it over. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, um, is the reason why there haven't been any, any really disruptive attacks on basic infrastructure because the act, there's no actors that are able to carry out those attacks or because actors are choosing not to carry them out? I, I don't know what you mean by disruptive attacks. The entire, I mean like, oh, sorry. Talk to Ukraine. I mean, yeah, talk yeah. to Ukraine. <laughs> the entire <laughs> nation was taken offline with no power. I'd say that was disruptive. And um, generators well, in the US know, as well. Uh, uh, so. One theory about uh, the attacks, and the, Ukraine has is, is been the target of relentless attacks by Russia. And one theory about that is that uh, Russia is using this as a test ground for further uh, cyber warfare. Any observations on that? It's probably true. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, All I, right, I, one more question, then we're going to go home and, and cry. <laughs> thank you all very much. This has been really uh, interesting and entertaining, so thank you. Um, you spoke a little bit about best practices for primarily external threats. I was wondering about guidelines and best practices for uh, internal threat detection and response. So the insider threat? Insider threats, correct. You're the man. It, it's all data driven. So, so the first thing you have to know is what you're trying to protect. Right? That's, that's the most key. If you don't have a good handle on what your data set is that you're trying to protect, you're lost. You, you, you're not gonna, you're not, there's nothing that you can do. And it's not about tooling. So, so parts education, but the majority is, do you know what you want to protect? Once you know what you want to protect, there are strategies for each of those things to handle. Um, I've worked cases where people are stealing financial data from, from financial firms and have gone to jail over it, right? Because of having good process, good controls in place, and knowing what was important to them. It's generally, it's generally more policy than technology. The technical piece comes as a method of measuring the success of your policy. So if you think about the technology has to um, be there simply to measure whether you have all those pieces together or not. Uh, there, there's so many ways to steal data, though. I could take a photo of it with a cell phone, right? I can walk out the door with it. It's not a big deal. Do you have the capabilities to to catch the low-hanging fruit, the easy stuff, and those take work. I'm happy to take it offline and have that conversation because it's, it's ugly, but things like having a data classification policy, knowing what's important to you, knowing what you should share, what you shouldn't share, having a way to label it, and having that work pervasively across your environment and not believing that your users are gonna be the ones to make that decision. It has to be automated for them or it's just not gonna work. If I could add to that too from a financial services, this is probably going to sound horrible. Uh, it's a step, it's a thought that goes, it's a thought that goes through my mind. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not 
And the reality is, is that in many financial institutions, it's not that difficult to have um, any, even an entry level person take out a couple screenshots, grab it off the, grab it off the system, throw it in a little satchel and walk out the door with it. Um, I, I, again, I hate to say it, you know what your policies are, know what, you know, classify your data, know who has access to what, limit that access as best that you can. Um, but wh where I'm getting at it, where it's difficult is when I hear about somebody who, uh, you know, uh, their spouse lost their job, their child has cancer you know, their wife or something got breast cancer. I feel horrible for them, but I also have to think from a data protection standpoint, they're now vulnerable, they may be desperate, they may have some motivation to take that data to get a little bit of money. And it, it's a horrible way to think about life and think about people, um, but that's, you know, we live a depressing life, so. So, if I can just add one more thing to, to your question, there was a study done with a quadrant where you have malicious, not malicious, insider, outsider, in terms of uh, causes of uh, security threats, and the vast majority uh, of actually security catastrophes, and the vast majority were an insider who is non-malicious. Huh. So simply by accident, by lack of discipline, Tripping by lack of maintenance. Power. My favorite's the chocolate bar study, that most users will give away private data for a chocolate bar. <laughs> Go look. So I have to start worrying when the vending machines run out? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just don't give your data. <laughs> just eat your chocolate. <laughs> well, listen, um, I just want to thank our panel. You've been fantastic. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.